All right, welcome back to the channel. This is actually a second part. If you haven't seen last week's video, I talked about how Americans are addicted to cars. So that is going to continue here. If you already know a lot of the urbanism beliefs and you've already watched channels like Not Just Bikes or City Nerd, RM Transit even, if you've already if you already know kind of where I'm going with this, Oh, and Alan Fisher. Don't forget that channel. I don't know how I forgot that channel. If you already kind of know all that, then you probably don't need to watch the first part if you haven't done so already. But I'd like to talk about this little thought experiment and what would it be like to design a city in the U.S. from scratch. So it's no surprise that right now we are living in a car-infested society here in the United States and in Canada. Again, some Canadian cities like Vancouver and Toronto do okay with not needing to drive. In fact, I would actually say those are the best cities in North America to not drive. New York City is that one weird... New York City might as well be its own country and they do things very differently there and that's also another pretty good gold standard right there. But anyways, other than that, most of us live in car-dependent suburbia and it's terrible. You drive your car to work, you drive your car to the store, you drive your car to your friend's house, you drive your car to... basically everything. It seems like in some places, when a new transit project is announced, some pushback is always received because it might make car travel slightly more difficult, or might make it not as an attractive of an option. But I gotta ask, isn't that kinda the point? get out of your personal vehicle and try out the transit project once it's done. You might actually be surprised that it's comfortable, it's convenient, it's hopefully frequent, and better than it was before. It might encourage you to live a better, more comfortable life and be healthier by physically getting out and walking or biking or whatever, rather than cars. However, some people seem to have an interesting thought about transit. It goes like this. Ew. I don't want to ride with the public. Riding transit feels like I'm riding in a vehicle with a ton of people who are too poor to afford a car. That, um, that is not what transit is designed for. It has never been what it's designed for. It's designed for moving people. That's it. If that's really the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about, oh, I, I don't want to use transit because I don't want to ride with poor people. Well, that's strange. It's, it's not that you're too poor to want a car. It might be that, no, they're not poor and they're actually using their money more wisely. If you have large swaths of money, but you don't have to buy a car because you, you live in an area where you don't really need to own one, well, then you can use that money for something that's actually going to be more useful to you. Like I said in the last, last week's episode, you shouldn't be forced into owning a car. You should only use a car as needed because, ideally, you would never need one. In fact, ideally, you wouldn't even need to use transit. You could just walk or bike anywhere from your house to get to many of the close essential needs, like stores or schools. Remember, your car sits still for 95% of the time without ever doing anything. It never contributes to society. In fact, it just pollutes the air every time you turn it on. And electric cars, while, yeah, they don't produce emissions, are still the same size, they still get stuck in the same traffic, and they have their own issues. And yet, no matter how far you travel, you still have an expensive car payment each and every month. And even after you've paid your car off, you might want to get another car, and then the cycle starts over again. Whereas, with more of an urbanism mindset, you might not need to do that. I'm going to provide a card up here to the Not Just Bikes YouTube channel because I highly, 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 highly recommend everybody who watches this video to go and watch. Just pick something. Pick something from that channel that looks interesting. Pick one video. Pick two videos from the Not Just Bikes channel that just look interesting to you and watch it. I guarantee you it will open your eyes 
larger than you ever thought possible. Your eye will be this big. <laughs> I think owning a car because you can makes about as much sense as investing in a 74 bedroom mansion. You don't really need it if you don't need it. Unfortunately, more often than not, here in Car Brain USA, you're pretty much forced into owning a car because you can't get anywhere without it. You might live in the middle of a suburban neighborhood and the nearest store is a couple miles away that nobody's gonna walk to. There's hardly any, if any, biking infrastructure and what the heck, there's no store in your suburb? That's weird. It's not weird to us in the US or Canada, but if you go to Europe and you're in those little villages that dot all the cities, all you gotta do is walk around a little bit, you're bound to find tons of stores, convenience stores or otherwise, and other services that you might need. But we don't do that here. Wanna get to work? Drive to work. Wanna go shopping? Drive. Visiting a friend? Drive. Go to your friend's pet goldfish's funeral? Drive. No, seriously, it's everywhere. I don't want to turn this channel into an urbanism thing. I, I don't want to change the trajectory of my channel. But I do want to open anybody's eyes that are watching this that doesn't already have their eyes open from all of these other channels. We are designing our cities terribly and to suffer. A car should not be required to live your life. Now, not everybody wants to live in the middle of downtown where that is often possible. So, yes, downtowns need to be this way because everything is so dense and so it just naturally makes sense that the first floor of a lot of buildings have a lot of businesses that are accessible to anybody on the street. But our suburbs are things that not enough people talk about because they are absolutely terrible. That is what we need to be doing. If anybody anywhere, except for I guess if you choose to live in rural society, but if everybody in urban or suburban areas could actually walk to places that they wanted to go, that would be amazing. Alright, so now time for my pipe dream. Now, yes, what really we should be doing is fixing our own car-dependent society. We really should be doing that first, but this here is going to be a bit of a thought experiment of what decisions should be made if you're going to build a city in North America from scratch. How would I do it? What would it look like? And what would the transit options be? What has come out of my head? So what would you see in this city? You would see not private cars. You would see lots of people walking, you'd see lots of people biking, you'd see tr lots of different types of transit vehicles, we'll get into that. You would see good density, high density in the city center, gradually scaling down. Zoning, which I haven't really talked about much, would be smartly designed to s gradually scale down the density as you get away from the city center. And you would see, you know, you'd still see taxis, Uber, Lyft, all of these types of services, but you wouldn't see people driving their own cars. There would also be lots of places to rent a car. That way, if you needed to travel out of town to a friend's house in a very specific area, or if you wanted to travel into rural Nowheresville, or if you wanted to travel anywhere, and it was not accessible by transit at all, and you didn't want to pay the extreme fees that you would probably pay on a taxi and possibly get stranded somewhere or whatever, then yes, there would be still areas to rent a car, which is far cheaper for you than having monthly car payments because, you know, it's just not great. The heart of the downtown area, the major downtown in my city, is sort of surrounded by a river. Everything within this area would be very, very closely monitored to where there would be hardly any cars at all in downtown. How would I do this? Well, like I said, it's kind of surrounded by a river. So all of the bridges that cross over that river would not carry car traffic. They would have bus only lanes or bus and taxi lanes. 
Some of them would be railroad only in the case of my regional rail tracks. There would be maybe one bridge that would carry car traffic for people that are, say, renting a car and need to travel outside of the city or something. But in general, you're not going to be driving in the city. Everybody else is. You're going to be riding transit or you'll be walking or biking into the city. It's going to be that low on cars. And here's another point that often gets overlooked. Train lines, all the train lines I describe, would get built first. You don't build the development first and then build the train afterward. You build the train first. Even if that seems weird and kind of backwards, it's not. Trains have done this forever. If the train lines are built first, even if it's just to an open field of nothingness, development can and will happen. Do you really think the south waterfront area of Portland was always high-rise towers? No. The streetcar was being constructed around the time that the first couple of high-rises were going up there. And now look at it. There's buildings absolutely everywhere. And this is just one example. Development can and will happen around your transit lines. So even if it looks weird to open a train line in the middle of a field for a few years, it will change. I guarantee it. It's almost kind of an example of the chicken and the egg. Which came first? Did the development come first or did the train line come first? The thing is, if you build a development first with no transit to it, and you just build the development, and then you start slowly adding transit to it, well, it's already been engraved in people's heads that they're going to have to drive out of that neighborhood because you've provided no alternatives. So then you add the transit later, and then you wonder why nobody uses the transit. If you build the transit there first, then the development and the developed area is going to get excellent transit from day one. And so that establishes the behaviors right there that people are going to travel by train or bus or just whatever, not by personal vehicle, because they don't have to own one. Let's get into the nitty gritty. Time to talk about the buses. There would be five types of buses. There would be 40 footers, 60 footers, another type of 60 footers, and there would be coach buses as well as shuttle buses. I'll talk about all of that. Double decker buses could be added to the really high ridership routes later, but for now let's just go with this. And my paint scheme would be all gray with a blue stripe underneath the windows. It's what I've come up with and yeah, it's simple, but it's distinctive. This might come as a surprise, but the downtown area I don't think would have a ton of buses. There would be some in downtown for sure, but see my next section on streetcars for what you'd be more likely to see in downtown. So for most of the downtown area and some of the inner suburbs, the general rule is that those are going to have 60-foot buses. They would have high presence, they would be everywhere, and they would come frequently. That way people would use them. Areas further from downtown would have lower density and so lower amounts of people, and so they would get the 40-foot buses. But still there would be a high priority on having high frequency. Remember when I said there were two types of 60-foot buses? I would have a second type of 60-foot bus that's sort of BRT-ish but it's sort of BRX, Bus Rapid Express. It again would have 60 foot buses that would be for use on everything. It would have three doors on the side, but you would be able to board through all three doors, just like our local FX service. So you would be able to board through any door and you'd be able to just sit on the bus, but these would be, you know, BRT. So they'd have internal bike racks. It would probably have wider doors and again, all door boarding but the buses would also be painted differently. They would still have a blue stripe underneath the windows, but the whole bus would be green instead of gray. And the most major difference is that these buses would only serve a couple stops. They would be hugely express. It would serve some sort of metro station or rail station or whatever, and it would take you pretty much straight to a popular destination with very, very few, never more than maybe three or four intermediate stops. 
In general, all types of buses would get traffic signal priority so that the buses can go through the intersections. But there would be a slightly higher priority for these express 60-footers. I don't really know exactly what I mean by that, but in general it would hold green lights for longer or it would absolutely make sure that these 60 foot express buses make it through the light and that they never ever ever stop. It would just, you'd be able to drive a bus continuously from one end all the way to the other without ever stopping. Whereas with the more local city bus service, you might be stopped at a light for a few seconds while other signals time out or whatever. Coach buses would be used for regional routes. There would be several regional bus lines that go from Union Station in the downtown area to some other set of cities in some corridor. These buses are more comfortable and you'd be on them for a long time, so they're used only for the regional routes. If this corridor becomes highly popular, then it would be definitely something to put on the planning board for turning into a regional rail line rather than a regional bus line. The shuttle buses would use mini buses similar to this one found on Ride Connection for their services. Just little mini buses that provide general neighborhoods access to transit that might take you from some sort of street to some business that's not as accessible by transit for one reason or another or maybe to some sort of hospital complex or university complex where there are lots of buildings and you might have a transit line that serves a main stop there but then that's kind of it so for additional service you might have some shuttle buses that would run a little more infrequently but they would still have their presence known in these areas as far as vehicles go and what i would choose I would put in New Flyers Excelsior buses because those are my personal favorite and this is my city and so I get to be <laughs> the god of this city. So I would choose New Flyers Excelsior buses XDE40 and XDE60 which are the 40 foot hybrid and 60 foot hybrid versions. There would be lots of these. Ideally we'd get some long range battery electric buses with chargers at all the stations that they would need to charge at. And so we could get some of the battery electric versions, the XE40 and XE60. Now as far as the BRT route goes, I would say those should be entirely electric. So those would be New Flyer XE60 with internal bike racks and slight seating layout differences as well as fare card readers at all the doors. Depending on terrain, you could also include some electric trolley buses of both sizes. But again, that entirely depends on terrain, as trolley buses are excellent for hilly routes. But because of streetcars that I'll talk about shortly, and wire compatibility, it might be more difficult than you'd want. But I wouldn't rule it out completely. Alright, let's talk about those streetcars. These would provide higher capacity than the buses, and so because of the dense downtown area, you're going to find a lot leading into and out of downtown. They don't go through some sort of transit mall in downtown where you would see a streetcar like every 15 seconds or something. No, there would be a grid in downtown and everything would be pretty much dead simple. If you're bored on some sort of streetcar in downtown, it pretty much just travels in a straight line leaving downtown and going to whatever nearby neighborhoods it would serve. I'll show a map later of what exactly it looks like, but I've definitely based the design on this off of Toronto's streetcar system because Toronto has a large and amazing grid of streetcar lines. Now the system itself has its own flaws like it being really 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 slow and not having traffic signal priority so I would definitely include those elements here. Absolutely, I, I don't think enough people talk about streetcars and transit signal priority in the same sentence. This might encourage very interesting things of development that happen right off of the streetcar line, which would encourage those people that live there to take the streetcar line where they work, which is probably downtown. So win-win. They would also connect with metro stations in the area and would be incredibly important for the area. They would also run very frequently. They would run no worse than 10 minute frequency through pretty much all day. 
major corridors would also get services 24 hours a day, which would allow people who work graveyard shifts or for people who went out drinking on Friday night to be able to know for sure that they'll be able to make it back home. Something else I'd consider is using green track, like what's done in Europe. This looks kind of visually appealing and also decreases noise. This really would be a quiet city. So assuming that this is the US, I would use the Siemens S700 streetcar as my fleet vehicle. I would design the trackway for those sort of clearances because, yes, the tight corners are nice to be able to take, but Siemens does make the streetcar version of the S700, which is a little shorter and can take tighter corners. So I would design it around that, whatever that turning radius is. I don't, I'm not sure what it is. And also, if possible, there would be yellow strips throughout the streetcar where you could press to request for your stop, and there would also be poles with stop buttons to be able to request for stops, because streetcars, again, would get signal priority, and you would be able to easily skip streetcar stops if there's nobody standing at them. That way, late evening trips can go faster, and it more matches the demand of the area and the time of day. Now on to the backbone of the area, which would be the metro system. I would say I've based this design largely off of the Vancouver Skytrain in Canada, and because lots of portions of this would be elevated, and it would travel through downtown underground. There would be four regular lines plus one line that is express and interlines with two other services. That's confusing. I'll show a map of that in a bit, but all lines would run at truly mind-blowing frequencies of no worse than six minutes, more or less all day long. Six minute frequency for all train lines. Portions that interline would get a train every three minutes. All lines would run 24 hours a day with 15 minute frequency all night long. Just like the SkyTrain, this system would be fully automated using the GOA4 standard, which basically means that trains can drive fully unattended with no drivers at all. Everything can happen fully automated, including the operation of the doors. So as a result, there aren't any operators, and so the rest of the transit system can focus on increasing frequency for bus and streetcar. And again, this is a 100% personal preference, but I would not choose stainless steel train cars and just put the most bland looking stainless steel metro cars in the system. Yes, they're easier to keep clean, but it's not very inviting looking, and it kind of looks outdated the moment they enter service. So I would pick something more like, hmm, the SkyTrain has. They would definitely probably have to be custom made because, and this is a 100% personal preference, I don't really like the barn door design of the SkyTrain doors. I do like the pocket doors of the Canada Line. So if you use the Canada Line trains, that'd be great, but then those are stainless steel. So if you kind of just think of a mishmash of all the types of trains in Canada, in Vancouver, Canada, then it'd be kind of something like that. When the lines first open, very likely the underground stations would have platform doors that perfectly align with the train cars doors. This adds safety, and if you have full height platform doors, can even add air conditioning to the underground stations, which is a huge bonus. All of the elevated stations would probably not come equipped with them at first, but I would make it so that they could easily be retrofitted in later, if it were needed. Four of the lines, lines A, B, C, and E, all run into downtown at some point. And so stations here would be long enough for six car trains. Six car fully walkthrough trains, open gangway design. They would not be individual train cars. The D line never enters downtown, it's a cross town line, and so it wouldn't have as high of ridership, but I would still build the stations long enough for four car trains. Also again, on the map that I'll show later, the E line runs express to the airport, so you'll have some sort of express service as well. So there will be a portion that's quad track. So it's a little bit of complexity in the system, but designed for people's maximum convenience. The express line is the one that goes all the way to the airport. And as promised, the professionally made map that I made in probably under an hour on MS Paint. Here you go. This is my third edition of this map. 
that I've had to make, but it does include the metro lines and the thin green lines you see on here are the streetcar routes. I've taken lots of inspiration from a few good Canadian cities when it comes to transit, like Vancouver or Toronto, but it also comes from other YouTube channels like Alan Fisher, RM Transit, Not Just Bikes, and more. And remember when I mentioned that there's a nice grid of streetcar lines in the middle of downtown, take a look at it, you can see them all there. There's also a waterfront streetcar line, and there are some other routes as well, and you can see how they connect with several metro stations. So I'll give you a few seconds to take a look at that. Alright, so now time for some more made-up destinations. I've created a regional rail map that has five train lines on it, and these are long lines. I'll show you a map of this one as well. Regional rail will run fully electric double-decker train cars that will service large distances. They would run at decent frequency for regional rail and would carry lots of passengers to cities that are not serviced by the immediate transit system. The general rule is that each city, each city, would only get one, maybe two stations within it. The stations are far apart. So if you were to ride the lines from one end all the way to the other, it would take you likely at least an hour and a half. So even if the lines look short on this map, they're not. The stations are just far apart. So what vehicles would I use? This one is a very easy question to answer. These are possibly my favorite double-decker trains to ever be made in the history of ever. Stadler has a plant in Utah that's building some trains for Caltrain that are going to be electric. The Stadler Kiss. I really like how these look and cannot wait to see these myself. I want to go down to California just to take a look at them. These are what would be used in the system. The only major difference is that they wouldn't have upper and lower doors. It would just be low floor, so there would just be the entrance to the lower portion of the train car. These units would likely be coupled in sets of six or so. All lines would connect at Union Station, and you could transfer easily from one to the other, all at Union Station. Then you could go up and into the station itself, and you could visit the metro trains underground, or to the bus loop right next door, which would have buses, the regional buses, that could take you to additional cities. There are some other technical things that I haven't really talked about, so those are going to be for part three, which will be going up next week. So stay tuned for that, and then we'll be done with this whole carless city and living your life on less car travel and more sustainable options. I'll see you next week.